Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the U.S. 401 Corridor Study Phase 2 public meeting. And again, I will stress this is a public meeting. We'll be reviewing the technical analysis of the corridor, seek input on specific concepts. Uh, one of the things I just want to share with you uh, as we go through the meeting process, uh, if you have any particular questions, uh, we have the question and answer feature that uh, is available for you all, as well as uh, we will be taking questions and answers following the presentation. Uh, what I'd also like to mention to you at this particular time, again, this is not a public meeting. And uh, of course, one of the things that we want to do in regard to this particular uh, input process is to seek short-term, mid-term, and long-term uh, projects for uh, the study area. So for uh, uh, content and personal reasons, we will not be asking or answering the question why, but note the fact that, of course, these projects have been in our MTP uh, from a historical perspective for many years. And what we are doing is doing a study to address short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions. Before I go forward with introducing the project team, what I'd like to have uh, Ms. Bonnie uh, Parker uh, basically uh, lay out some additional uh, ground rules uh, concerning uh, this public meeting. So Bonnie, if you wish to provide any more input, you can do so. Can you believe I just did that? Um, thanks, everybody. So I'm Bonnie Parker from Campo, and thanks so much to everyone for joining this evening. We've got a great um, set of attendees, definitely a full house. Um, and the way the meeting is going to flow this evening is we're going to start off um, with a presentation that explains a little bit about where the um, study has been so far. We're in the middle, uh, coming up on the, the last half of the project. And uh, where a lot of the technical work that's been done um, and then what some of the alignment options are looking uh, into the future. And those are the key things that we are really trying to get feedback on right now um, at this point in public engagement for the study. So our biggest goal tonight is to make sure folks understand a lot of this technical work. We're trying to bring it to you in a very, very simple but high level um, uh, context to give you a good understanding of what we've been looking at so far and all the data analysis. But um, we also um, have reserved the latter half of the meeting for answering questions. We know there are a lot of questions about the study. Um, and so that's when you'll hear my voice again. I'll come back on later um, to help guide us through the questions and answers. We strongly encourage that you put questions and answers in that Q&A panel. For me, on a computer, the Q&A panel is the, one of those boxes over on the right. You should have a box for participants, a box for chat, and a box for Q&A. And if you don't, feel free to let us know in chat, and we can give a little bit more guidance on how to get there. Um, any technical questions or logistical questions, please feel free to put those in chat. We're going to be watching the technical side of the meeting in the chat box. We're trying to organize questions in the categories and make sure that we get through all of them through the Q&A box. Um, and, uh, oh, good. Here's the screen about how to submit an actual question over onto the side. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I feel like I've forgotten something else. Oh, the folks, you're all muted for right now so that the presentation and the bandwidth are all okay. We will be rolling through questions, though, at the end. And we do have a few people that are phone callers. One of the things to make this meeting accessible is to always offer a call-in option for folks that need to be unmuted. I do want to warn you that we're going to push those to the end because logistically it can take a lot of time to unmute people and put them back on mute and whatnot. So I um, will come back later. We'll run through questions. Um, I think that was everything that I was supposed 
to uh, to say. Back to you, Kenneth, or did I forget something? Thank you, Bonnie. No, you, you sure didn't. Just want to remind, I see a question in the uh, chat box as to, uh, or not a question, basically a comment. I do not see, again, the Q&A box. Again, as Bonnie mentioned, if we, uh, depending upon your computer, you go to your far bottom right, uh, you'll see icons that say participants, uh, an icon that addresses chat. And then after that, there may be three, uh, looks like periods. And in that box, if you were to open that up, you'll be able to see the question and answer feature located there. So this is just a reminder as to what Bonnie had just mentioned. So again, thank you, Bonnie, for that. Before we go any further, what I'd like to basically share with you and mention to you is uh, a lot of work has been put in by our project team in this analysis process. I want to thank them for that particular work. With uh, us on hand and those who will be a part of the presentation, of course, are Mr. Mike Shirosky, uh, as well as Siobhan Shalat from WSP, along with Ms. Genevieve Canelius and uh, Sarah Parkins from WSP. They've been very active in this exercise, not only putting together the technical analysis, but also providing information along with Ms. Bonnie Parker for uh, public input and being uh, engaged in developing a public toolbox and putting all this information together. So we wish to thank them for that. I want to also welcome the panelists who are also engaged in this process, which includes staff from the town of Pequay Marina, as well as uh, our uh, director for the Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, Mr. Chris Lucasena, some others who are joining us. We appreciate uh, their participation as well. But beyond that, well, without further ado, what I'd like for us to do is go ahead and begin with the presentation. So take it away, Project T. Great. Thank you, Kenneth. And so what we're going to do is, as Kenneth mentioned, we're going to go through uh, what we've done so far, this is phase two. We are we are going to go th where we basically went through the technical analysis. Uh, we took a lot of input from phase one and turned it into some of the items that we looked at in phase two. Um, I'm going to go through some overview items. Uh, we're going to talk about a review of the phase one public engagement. We're going to talk about the sections of the study, and then we're going to end it on uh, some Q and A. And we'll 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 hang out here until we uh, can answer all your questions. So, uh, real quick, just an overview of the project. If you're not familiar with it. Um, it is US 401 existing from just below Banks Road or right at Banks Road in Wake County down to Lillington in Harnett County uh, with a future 401 section. It's about a 19 mile section and about seven miles proposed for the future US 401 section. So just real quick, some of the things that we're looking at as part of this and Kenneth mentioned a couple of these already. Um, we're in the midst of planning and design. We wanna help create a vision for the corridor our, our real goal, one of our real goals is to come up with short and long-term solutions and really have implementable projects. We wanna be able to, what comes out of this, take it to, uh, to try to get funded and to, to, to put a, turn them into real projects. And so I wanna do a little bit of background first and talk about um, this section of 401 and the history in the area. Um, so real quick, the initial alignment of the future 401 section was adopted by the Board of Transportation in 1997. Uh, with revised alignment approved in 1999. Uh, that section has been included in the MTP since 2002. That first MTP was the 2025 up to the most recent MTP, the 2045 MTP. Um, this study focuses on improving existing 401 and exploring alternative alignments for that future 401 section. And so we're looking at everything. We're, we're trying to look at intersections and, and everything along that corridor and how to make this area better. Um, and we are looking at this while we are focused on US 401. The way that we're really looking at this is a network and how 401 works in the network in the area in both Southeast Wake County and Harnett County. Uh, to this point, we've had three meetings and review with the core technical team. Uh, the core technical team, the, or as we call them the CTT, is comprised of campus staff, uh, the, some staff from the towns of Fuqua Verena, Andrew Lillington, and the staff from the counties of uh, Wake County and Harnett County, and NCDOT and some others. We've also had two meetings and review with what we're calling the study oversight team or the SOT which is comprised of the CTT, uh, some lo local elected officials, community leaders, local organizations, and some others on that as well. And so I wanna go first into schedule and where we are in the schedule. So there's, there's two things to take from this slide. 
One is the anticipated timeline of the entire corridor. Um, and just want to talk real quick about what we call the project life cycle. And in the project life cycle, you see at the top there is, is typically made up of seven parts of that life cycle. And the first one is planning, and that's where we are. So we are in the initial part of uh, the timeline of that project cycle for any projects along this corridor. Um, where we are in this study is in phase two, as I mentioned. Phase one was a lot of existing conditions analysis. In phase two, we are developing solutions, which is where we are with this meeting. This is the phase two public engagement. Phase three, we'll be developing preferred alternatives and then finally adopt at the end. I do want to mention just that to give you kind of a sense of where things stand in the project or, or where things stand in the whole project life cycle. Um, this meeting, if you compare this to a project that's going on right now, NC540 is under construction right at this moment. Um, where NC540 was in this timeline was about 2000, 2001. So back in 2000, 2001, they were, that's when they were going through the, when NCDOT and Campo was going through the initial planning of that. And so we're going to initial planning here. So we're really looking potentially at projects that could come out of this as, you know, as far as 20 years out. So, you know, our, when we look at goals for the project, um, we, wanted, we wanted to really hone in on some specific things. Um, one is to reduce congestion and increase transportation capacity and safety. Safety was a big concern, not just um, vehicular safety, but all modes. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. We want to encourage economic development. We think that's an important part of it. And we know that our the Campo uh, leaders feel that's an important part of it. We want to incorporate public and stakeholder input. We find that of utmost importance to be able to, to, to pull what we can from the public and, and try to engage as much as we can, engage everyone and get information from, from the public, and then accommodate all appropriate modes of travel. And that's transit, bicycle, pedestrian, freight. And when we talk about those modes, we're talking about safety as well. We want to make sure that we're taking into account safety of those. Um, not only safety of bike pads, not of vehicles, but also at the railroad crossings too, which we did, which we are looking at in this study. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Sarah Parkins um, for a little bit to talk about the phase one engagement. Thanks, Mike, and good out or good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Um, we did just want to give a quick quick update about phase one's engagement, and really just wanted to thank everyone that participated in our survey and our first public meeting. Um, during that first phase, we did have over 60 virtual partic uh, meeting participants and just over 1,100 online survey participants. So I see that tonight we've already exceeded our first meeting attendance um, and looks like we are on track for exceeding our online survey participants as well. I did want to let you know that we do read through all of the comments that we received through our surveys um, and really take that information to accelerate the project, right? So on the first survey, we asked what your vision was for the corridor and asked some questions specifically about what we should be focusing on when making recommended improvements for, um, for all of the segments along the corridor. And so from that information, we did take um, the past vision statements from other projects that have been done throughout the corridor. We took those, those visions and updated them to reflect the comments we received in the first survey to create our vision statement for the um, for the US 401 corridor study moving forward. So that new vision statement now is here on the screen um, and I'll read it out. The US 401 corridor study will provide a multimodal framework to accommodate growth and development through improved travel conditions that are safe and accessible while supporting economic development and maintaining the character and livability of the area. And so that vision statement really came directly out from the comments that you provided on the survey. So we'll talk a little bit more about the survey later in the presentation, but we um, we appreciate all the feedback we've been receiving um, and look forward to reading through the comments on our current survey. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Sarah. So what I'm gonna be doing primarily for the rest of this presentation is go through some of our design concepts and technical analysis that we've done on the study so far. So when we talk about alternatives and alignments, um, we always want to take into account constraints. And we wanted, we wanted to show this as the first slide to let everyone know that we are taking all of these things into account when we're creating any sort of alternatives. These are all important. These are the questions that we're, we're asking you questions specifically on the survey about this. So we hope everyone has taken the survey. If you have not yet, please do. Um, but do want to point out some of those things that we were looking at as far as hard constraints. And there is a lot that's happening in this area. And so we wanted to just, you know, hone on that first, let you know that we are looking at these things as we look at these alternatives. 
to go along with what um, what we look at from an alternative perspective, a roadway perspective, we always want to talk about land use. Land use and transportation goes hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And so what we're looking at is existing land use um, on the left side of this and then, a, and then future land use on the right. And as you can see, the land use of the area is changing with the growth patterns that are happening in the area. And these are from um, the town's uh, jurisdiction. This is part of Wake County. And so you can see the difference between the, the changing land uses in the area. And we're, we're really seeing more of a shift to that medium density residential. So we can't, again, as I mentioned earlier, we can't look at this project in a vacuum. Um, there are a lot of other planned projects in this area that are either part of the MTP or ongoing right now. Um, some of these projects on here are, are in process and some of them are in the MTP. Um, the ones that from this list that are in process, there has been sections of the Fuquay Arena Eastern Parkway that's been um, constructed by developers. The U5751 and NC55 and 42 grade separation of the US 401, that project is in project development. The Western Anger Bypass is um, actually in within right away um, right now. So there are actually some of these projects that are going on. And we did take all of these things into account when we were doing technical analysis. So all of these are extremely important. We're looking at not just 401, but the network of this area. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into each section. We kind of broke this up into sections because there are distinct sections and they all have different, they might have different character and we wanted to talk about them individually. And so the first one that we're going to look at is what we're calling the future US 401 section. Uh, this is a new alignment roadway that starts just south of Banks Road. It does cross 42 and 55 and terminating at the Wake Harnett County line. Uh, there could be a potential extension to Piney Grove Walls, but we're also looking at alternatives in the area. We're going to go through those alternatives here in the next few minutes. So real quick, from a traffic perspective, um, without the future 401, there's more red and black on the left side. With the future 401, there's less. Um, obviously, it would help uh, traffic flow in the area. What we're looking for is, is that the, the travel time in the network is being decreased with the growth forecasts that are happening in the area. And I'm going to go through those growth forecasts here in a minute. So if we're looking at traffic dispersion and we're, and we're using the regional model when we do this, we're seeing that people that live in this area and travel from this area in both Harnett County and Southeast Wake County are really dispersing to a lot of different places. There's a lot of a lot of people are going toward downtown Raleigh. A lot of people are going towards that future 540 that will take in the RTP. A lot of people are going towards Holly Springs and Apex. And so there really is a varied, um, very traffic flow in this area where it does go to different portions of, of the rest of the, of the triangle. So I'm going to go into how, you know, the, the creation of the alternatives and I'm going to go through sections. And we did kind of split these up into sections as well, just to make it easier to look at, especially when we're looking at hard constraints. As I mentioned earlier, we're taking all those hard constraints into account. The A section is uh, between 401, existing 401 and NC42. B is between 42 and 55. And then C is between NC55 uh, and 401 with the possible extension to Piney Grove or, Rawls, or, or Piney Grove Wilbon Road. So before we get, I dive into those things, I do want to mention that we, what we're looking at here is what we call a partial access controlled facility. What that means is that we will control access at any interchanges, at any major, major intersections. And so we'll make sure that um, what happens at those interchanges and intersections, uh, that there's that people can't, grant, can't gain access to those areas, but we could potentially have access in other places. This will be further defined in phase three as we get into uh, providing preferred alternatives. Uh, we'll most likely have interchanges at the original um, intersection or inter, you know, where it hits US 401 at the north end of the study. There's a railroad right there, so we're going to have to do a grade separation. And then interchanges at NC42 and NC55, where we're seeing larger, um, larger traffic volumes and, and need, for, uh, need for interchanges into the future. Um, at the other intersections, we're looking at at-grade reduced conflict intersections to increase safety and traffic flow. I'm going to get into that in a minute on the next slide, what, what an RCI actually is and why it helps and why it's going to help safety and, and why it's going to help traffic flow. We're going to have right-in, right-outs and other things like that. So to get into the RCI, this is on what you'd see on the screen right here is actually an example of a reduced conflict intersection that is in Rollsville. Um, this is US 401 uh, that is, goes around Rollsville. And what it is, it's, it uses median U-turns and median left turns to reduce conflict points. That's one of the big things it does. That's why it's reduced conflict intersection. So it's actually a lot safer. It actually also really helps traffic flow. 
Um, so it really, it, it also can help pedestrian movements. There's a pedestrian movement through here that uh, will isolate where the pedestrians can move. So it has a lot of really good things that, you know, really a lot of good benefits that uh, could happen with this type of intersection. So as we look at, you know, the developments in the area and the growth potential, um, what we're seeing and, and from the modeling is that by 2045, the population of Fuquay is going to more than triple. And so we, we need to prepare for that now. We want to prepare for that now. Um, the employment's also inspected, expected to uh, projected to increase. And so we're, we're looking at these alternatives with some of that in mind. There's already a lot of proposed development, as you can see in this picture right here, what's in the, the dark kind of brownish is active and planned developments. And so you can see throughout this area, there are active and planned developments already, and we expect that there'll most likely be more into the future. So now I'm gonna go straight into that section A, which is the section between 401 and 55. And I do wanna mention real quick that while we're looking at distinct sections, section A, section B, section C, the, they, the sections that could potentially come into the preferred alternative don't necessarily have to connect right now. They could connect in the future, and we would figure out how to do those connections between. What we're really looking for is what will work in each area and then, and then connect them all together. Um, so this first one, all of the sections, the ones, the, so the A1 on this, B1 on the next, C1 on the last one, is the MTP alignment. That is the current alignment that is in Campos 2045 MTP. Um, all of the three alignments. So A3 on this follow existing roadways. So on this one, A3 follows Hilltop Road um, all the way from 40, 401 to 42. And part of that is what's considered the Hilltop Road Extension Project that is currently under study right now uh, with NCDOT, um, which is going is to improve the intersection at Hilltop Road um, and Hilltop Needmore Road. Um, and then alignments A2, A4, and A5 are all new alignments. And when we get through these, you'll see that how we're looking at them and what, what the effect of the constraints are, what, or how the constraints affect where the alignments go. So let's go to the next section. So section B, this is the section between 42 and 55. And what we're looking at here, again, B1 follows the existing MTP. B3 follows Walter Myatt Road. Um, pretty much the whole way between 42 and 55. And then alignments B2, B4, B5, and B6 are new alignments. Um, some of them may overlap. Um, we understand that. And then, you know, as we were looking at this, one of the things that came out of this is, you know, where B3, B4, and B5 really come down Walter Myatt Road to hit NC55 is extremely close to where the Western Andrew Bypass is actually going to be going, where it's going to be constructed. And so one of the alternatives that we're going to be looking at into the next phase is potentially tying that into that 55 uh, Andrew Bypass to provide a direct connection to US 41 and Lillington. And that the only difference there is we would most likely have to use NC210. If you're familiar with the area, NC210 is the direct route from Andrew to Lillington. Uh, it's a two-lane road, but it could be used in the future for part of this. So we are going to take that into account. This was something that came out of a lot of meetings that we had with the CTT and some suggestions from the CTT. So we wanted to make sure that we provided this, this evening to you all to let you know that this is an alternative we'll, we'll be looking at into the next phase. And then section C. So you can see there's a lot here. C1 is the MTP alignment. Um, C3 follows Kennebec Church and Rawls Church Roads. Um, and then C2, C4, C5, and C6 are new alignments. Um, so there's the, the reasons we looked at different alignments here is because of the growth that's happening in Harnett County, not just in Wake County. There's a lot of uh, development activity in Northwest Harnett County. And so one of the things that we tried to do was not only provide what was in the MTP to, to bring this roadway uh, back to right around the county line, but also see if there's something we could do to go into Harnett County to give direct access to those that are um, having developments or, or thinking about planning developments in Harnett County. The other thing too that we, we looked at here is Piney Grove Rawls Road, which turns into Piney Grove Wilbon Road in Wake County. Uh, that's a heavily traveled uh, roadway coming from Harnett County. So there's so we wanted to see if, if what would work is connecting roads or connecting a new road directly at that point to really bring that all into one one area that would make it easier for traffic flow through that kind of northern part of Harnett County. And so, you know, as part of what we're looking at here is part of the alternatives for this, we're looking at what the impacts are. And so what this is telling us is that there's, there's trade-offs on each impact. And if you went through the survey, you know, that was really the highlight of what we were asking is what are, what are, what the, what are the trade-offs 
that you're willing to to look at and work with on on this project to be able to to pick a preferred alternative alignment. So as you can see here, what we've done is we've created a table where we're talking about which alignments are least impacted to certain constraints and which ones are most impacted to certain constraints. So what I mean by that is if you look at that first one, that section A, where it says properties impact, A2 and A4 impact the least amount of properties. A5 impacts the most amount of properties. So we have collected you know, the data that we need to, to, to be able to tell you these things. This is part of the technical analysis. Um, and you can see we put them in the categories, property impact, agricultural land impact. We know there's a lot of voluntary agriculture districts in this part of Wake County. We want to make sure that we're not impacting those. And there's there could be potential environmental impacts. There's a lot of blue lines. There's a lot of wetlands um, as part of this project. And then, of course, cost at the end of the day. We want to talk about cost as well. So you can see on all three of these sections, the ones that had the least, the alignments that had the least amount of impact on certain things and some had the most amount of impact. And as you can see, you know, let's say you want to choose, I'm just going to choose A4 as an example. Let's say for you, the most important thing was what's properties impacted, but not as much the agricultural land or environmental impacts. A4 would be a good one. You know, if you, if you care more about um, environmental impacts, A3 would be your one. But, you know, that also has, has other effects on other things. So there's trade-offs on here. Um, what we're saying is that, and this is no secret, there's no perfect alternative. What we have to do is we have to talk about trade-offs. And so that's why we're asking you that question in the survey. We want to hear from you. We really believe that your comments, your reaction to the survey, your answers to the survey are really going to affect how we move forward in this project and which one of these we're going to select from here on out. Want to get a little bit into the roadway sections that we're looking at here. Um, so what we're talking about is a four lane divided roadway. So two lanes in each direction. Um, one of these has a 16 foot wide multi-use path on one side. That's more in the controlled. If we if we do a control of access facility where we do not allow access, that's more likely. Um, if we do, we could also we have a, a potential to do 12 foot wide multi-use paths on both sides. Um, which could be more of a controlled act or a uncontrolled access where we actually allow access to, um, to the roadway. The key on this one, though, with the multi-use path, and we're, I'm going to get into this in a few minutes, is we want this to be a part of the connection of the of the community. Um, there's a triangle bikeway project going on right now that Campo is doing. We really want to see this as a as a connection to that, and to really have those multi-use path bike ped connections throughout the entire triangle. It's where we really want to set that up for the future. Um, on these, on the the bottom two, the one-way ramp and the two-way ramps, those are at those inter, at the interchanges. We're looking at both one-way ramps um, and typical. If you if you think about um, typical interchanges, they're you know typically diamond interchanges where you have one-way ramps. But we're also looking at two-way ramps in places where we could potentially reduce right-of-way impacts. And so we're looking at a lot of different interchange types to to do that such thing. We want to really reduce right-of-way impacts as much as we can on the interchanges. So. We're going to go we're going to go to the next section, which is the US 401 in Wake County. This is the existing section. Um, so this is the section between Banks Road and the Harnett County line. And so we're going to be looking at this uh, section next. So go ahead. The next slide. First thing we want to talk about, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's not just vehicular. It's not just vehicles that we're worried about with safety. It's bicycles and pedestrians that we're also worried about with safety. And so we wanted to highlight real quick that there have been crashes in this area. Um, both from a bicycle and a pedestrian standpoint. Um, yes, it's over 13 years, but you know, as we're, as we're getting closer to you know trying to have zero tolerance of of any fatalities or any accidents or any crashes that involve bicycles and pedestrians, we want to make sure that it's as safe as it can be for both um, both of those users, um, especially as we're talking about multimodal uses uh, in this corridor. So again, not to further dilute this, but this area really has five distinct sections. And, and we really need to look at each one individually to get a better sense for what will work in each of those areas. And we do have alternatives in each of those. Um, the first section is the is more of what we're calling the more suburban section from Banks Road to the railroad track. So this is the railroad crossing that's right near the 4255, the five points, what's called the five points intersection. So right near there. The next section is from that point to Judd Parkway. And then the next section is from Judd Parkway to Ennis Street, where you can go over into downtown Verena. Um, the next section is Ennis Street to Judd Parkway through downtown Pupay, which we're not going to touch, honestly. 
um, in that area. We we feel that as a place where we're not really going to make any changes or have no no uh, no other things to do. But we are going to talk about one specific intersection there as we go through this. And then the last part of this is Judd Parkway down to Harnett County, where we're really looking at it breaking back out to a more suburban section as you get out of downtown Fuquay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these individually. As I mentioned, this, this typical section is for the area between Banks Road and 55. Currently, it's a four-lane divided. Um, what's proposed, and it is in the MTP this way, is a six-lane section. There is enough traffic. This is really our highest traffic area in all of the project. Um, there's a lot of traffic kind of converging in this area that is then dispersing out to other places in Southeast Wake County from here. And so we are looking at a six lane section here and it'll be most likely from that Banks down to uh, Banks Road down to 55. And I want to mention, too, there will be multi use paths on uh, on both sides. That's that's the plan. This section from NC 55 uh, to Judd Parkway. Um, currently, it's a five lane with a, a section with a two way left, what's called a two way left turn lane. A lot of utilities, as you can see, we put utility poles on here. There's a lot of utilities on both sides of the road. There are some sidewalks in places. Um, what we're looking at here is both from an access management standpoint and from a safety standpoint is adding a median. Um, this is actually a proposed project also in the MTP um, and NCDOT is looking at this as well, that there is, could be a potential for a median here with some enhanced uh, potential multi-use paths or enhanced sidewalks um, on both sides. Um, but really, it's about making it a lot, a lot safer corridor um, as the growth continues to happen in the corridor. From Judd Parkway to Inner Street, we have a little more leeway here because there's less traffic um, on this part. And so we're looking at a, a few different options here. The current is a five lane section. Um, one concept we're looking at is, is actually narrowing down to two lanes, one lane in each direction with a multi-use path, really, really enhancing the bike ped movements in the area and really making them the focus of that between here and, and that downtown downtown Verena area. Um, the second concept is a four lane divided, kind of using the same concept as we did in the previous section, um, also with the multi-use path. Again, trying to make it safer, really trying to hone in on it being a multimodal corridor. Uh, this is Judd Parkway to, to Harnett County. So we skipped that middle section, just want to mention this. Um, in downtown Fuquay, we skipped that because it's it's right now it's a two lane uh, with parking or a three lane section, and we really don't see any changes there to that section. We know that there's development going on in that section of downtown, and so we did we didn't want to touch that one. Um, but we but here as we're looking from Judd Parkway to Harnett County, um, the existing section is three lanes, and so we're we're considering that. But also there is a proposed uh, project into the future to make it a four lane divided section. This is a lot of that traffic coming off of Judd Parkway. As you know, if you drive down 401 right now from the north and you're driving into town, it actually signs, there's, a, there's signs for you to, to get on Judd Parkway to go to 401 South. And then this would be the continuation essentially of that uh, kind of traffic pattern as people use Judd Parkway to get around to the south side of town um, and would be a four lane divided section with some sidewalks and potentially multi-use paths. So I mentioned we were looking at one intersection in that downtown Fuquay area. Um, this is the intersection of Wake Chapel Road. I'm sure a lot of you that go through town are very familiar with this section of road. It's a, it's a little bit of an unsafe intersection. Um, and so what we're looking at here is a few concepts that we can do. Uh, we have, um, you know, the railroad, as, as I call, these are opportunities for excellence. Um, we have a railroad here, we have safety, we have um, access issues. And so we're looking at a lot of different concepts here that we could potentially use. The other great thing about um, using a roundabout, as you can see in these three on the screen, we're talking about roundabouts. One of the other great things about using roundabouts is they're great for entry features into areas. So it's really it really tells you that you kind of stepped into a different area and you're you know, it's a it's a gateway feature. And so there's really a lot of good aspects to this. It's not just being able to move traffic better and safer, but it's also from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, we realize that there that roundabouts, you know, may have some right away impact. So we will be looking at that into the next phase. Um, but just wanted to share some concepts that we have at this intersection. On the on the screen here, you see three roundabout concepts. One of them, uh, two of them have one roundabouts. The other one has two roundabouts. Um, and then on the next screen, we have three other concepts. One is from the Southwest Area Study, um, which is to terminate. Actually, that's number six. <clears throat> actually, that's not right. Which is number five, um, which is the railroad street right in, right out. Um, but we're also talking about potentially restricting some sort of access, whether it's restricting access on, from Wake Chapel Road or restricting access from Railroad Street. We're taking all of these into account. Um, we want to get feedback from from everyone, CTT, SOT, see what they see what they think. 
Um, again, we're just trying to find ways to improve safety in the area. Um, last but not least on this area, we wanna talk about transit. Right now, there's a, there's a transit um, that comes down to Wake Tech. And the, what we're looking at is extensions of this transit down in the Fuquay. And we're looking for opportunities where we could do parking rides uh, for that express service. Um, potential extension of what was called the 40X, um, which is the, the, the Go Raleigh 40X um, buses. And so we're looking for opportunities where we can use transit as this grows. There's going to be more opportunities for transit. We could potentially look into the future as well at, at potential connections to Holly Springs and Apex as more people use that NC55 corridor. Oh, I guess it wasn't last. This is last, but not last. So bicycle pedestrian facilities. We are not only looking at that the bicycle facilities, as I mentioned earlier, on the future 401 section, which is that potential Triangle Bikeway South, that connection to the Triangle Bikeway, uh, eventually up to that Triangle Bikeway that Campo is studying right now. But one of the best ways to enhance bicycle and pedestrian movements is to provide not only multi-use paths or sidewalks on the existing corridor, but also look at parallel corridors. And so we're looking at potential parallel corridors for bicycle movements. Uh, we want to make sure it's safe for all bicycle users, because when you talk about bicycle users, there's a lot of different users. Um, you know, we want to make sure it's safe for children riding bicycles, as well as those that ride bicycles recreationally or for or for commuting. Um, and so we want to make sure it's safe for all users. And so we're looking at those things, both sidewalks, multi-use paths, and parallel bike connections. And last but not least, if we look at the three sections on this project, this is US 401 in Harnett County. Um, Harnett County is growing immensely. And so this is an extremely important section for us uh, to look at. So let's go to the next slide. Just want to go through real quick uh, where this is. This is from the Wake County line down to the NC-210 um, intersection there at and US-421 and NC-27 down there in Lillington. Or right before you get into Lillington, I should say. So the what we're looking at here is widening this uh, existing section to a four-lane divided roadway. Um, Multi-use path on one or both sides. We want to accommodate future traffic, uh, accommodate all the future traffic that's going to be along this road. Um, there could be potentials for realignments. Um, we have a lot of growth areas in here. We have a lot of neighborhoods that are being built here. Um, so, um, you know, there's there's uh, there's the areas of Clibbit Springs and Kipling where we look at where there's more of an urban type, you know, curbed area. And so we're looking at different concepts here, um, whether we need to, you know, how, how the development patterns are affecting where the future road should go or sh it should stay in its current location. Uh, we will be improving intersections along the way, Piney Grove Rawls, Clibbit Road, Clibbit Springs Road and Rawls Church Road. And so as we look at the growth, as, we, as you can see on the screen, much like we did um, earlier in Wake County, when we're looking in Harnett County, you can see there on the on the map on the right, what's in brown is active and planned development. As you can see, there's a lot going on. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the 2045 model shows population increasing. Um, we, we believe that 2055 model, the 2050 model may show a higher increase here. Um, so, you know, employment's going to increase, population's going to increase. There's a lot of new developments along this road um, and, and in the other roads as well, Kipling Road, Harnett Central Road, um, you know, uh, uh, Rawls Church Road. So there's a lot of development here. And so we want to make sure we're serving all the needs of, the, of this part of Harnett County. Again, when we look at these alternatives, D1, D2, D3 and D4, we're looking at the same exact thing we did in Wake County with trade-offs. Um, D2 and D4, you know, has, has the least amount of property impacts. Um, you know, agricultural land impact lease is D1 and D3. And so we're really looking at a balance. This again, this is where your, your answers to the survey are really going to affect our decision making process moving forward. And so some of the concepts that we're looking at as far as widening um, the existing roadway, the existing sections, two lanes. If you drive through here, I'm sure you see it all the time. And so what we're looking at is a four lane section that does not have curb, um, it's more of a little wider section. Could use multi-use paths on both on both sides, or have a sidewalk multi-use path option. Again, we're looking at all modes, so we want to make sure we accommodate all modes. Um, but the second alternative here is, like I mentioned earlier, there are some areas of existing 401 in, in Harnett County that does have curb, where the houses are closer to the road and, and things like that. So we we wanted to give a more urban section uh, where we do have curb and gutter, where we do have sidewalks, um, just as an alternative uh, through maybe some of those middle areas, like I mentioned in Calibut Springs and Kipling. 
one of the, the big things we looked at as part of the study, as I mentioned earlier, is railroad crossings. Um, we want to make sure that all the railroad crossings, there's, if, if you're familiar with this part of Harnett County, there, that railroad really is parallel to US 401 most of the way. And there's a couple crossings of 401 that, you know, are at angles and we may want to look at changing. And so, you know, we looked at each of these individually and really came up with not only the reasons why that there need to be recommendations, but also recommendations for what we could do at each of those railroad crossings. A lot of the railroad crossings are really close to 401, even though they're on other roadways. Um, you know, the one on Matthews Road is really close. Um, the Calibit Road crossings are really close to 401. We may have turn lanes that are necessary on those roadways to improve the intersections. Just the widening of 401 could potentially change where those are. And so we want to make sure that we're adding enough infrastructure there to make sure that the ag grade crossings are safe. The other things that we're looking at is potentially closing some ag grade crossings. It gives you a couple things. One is it helps you with access to some of the properties. Um, it also will allow you to do more projects into the future with the railroad. And so we're looking at those as well. And again, these are recommendations that we're making now that we hope to refine more into the phase three of this project. Um, talking about bike pad again, this is a multimodal study, right? So we want to look at bike pad. And so we're looking at not just parallel routes or a multi-use uh, multi path facility along 401, but along um, any of the sections of 401, even if, if it's not included, if we don't choose the existing section, if we choose a different section, we want to make sure it happens. But really one of the big things here is we know Harnett County has done a lot of work already that they have looked at greenway plans in this section of Harnett County. We want to make sure that whatever we do on this study does connect to those. So we want to make sure they're planned with the, with the that they're done uh, along with the planned greenways along Neils Creek and Hector Creek and want to make sure we have parallel bike networks that and bike improvements that do match and meet each other. We don't want to leave a, a section just out there without connections. We want to make sure that there's connections. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit more about public engagement activities. Or actually, no, I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. Sorry. I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie, who's actually going to take it from here on public engagement activities. Um, and then we will get into Q&A after that. Perfect. Um, thanks again, Mike. I know that that is a lot of stuff and you were on fast forward. So um, just to remind everybody that this public meeting recording will be um, on the US 401 corridor website. Sorry about that. I just turned my video on. Um, so the meeting recording, give us a couple days to uh, get it posted up to YouTube and then we'll put a link on the project website. You can always go back and listen to um, the presentation again. Um, and then we're uh, going to hop into some of our question and answers here in just a second. But one of the best ways um, to give feedback is through the survey period. We are really, or through the online survey, where the survey is broken up into the different sections that Mike just went through. The phase that we're in is the completion of that technical analysis and moving into recommended alignments. And as you saw, um, there's a lot of pieces of spaghetti out there right now, and we need feedback on each piece. We've identified trade trade-offs, um, and we need the community's help and weigh in input on which piece, which trade-offs, which way to go, and uh, how to weight some of, some of those. We've received a lot of questions over the last few weeks about how we determine um, which criteria are going to be um, given priority over others. And that's different with each and every project. And that's exactly what this survey is trying to get at. So um, we really need your help. We need your input. It's just at the US 401 corridor study.com website. Um, and there are a lot of materials there. There are PDF versions, um, accessible versions, versions in Spanish. Um, we can get paper surveys to anybody who wants to make sure to distribute them to, to a local group or neighbors or whatever. So um, your help to help spread the word would also um, be greatly appreciated um, to encourage your uh, friends, neighbors, anyone who you think might be interested in the area, um, both uh, folks who live there and who work there who are commercial uh, businesses or property owners, we um, really do want to hear from the community on this. So, and then actually I wanted to, uh, was that the last slide on that or uh, do we do one more on the, uh, where we, where this project goes from here? Okay, the, the one other thing is we will still be coming back out with the recommendations. 
as well. So <clears throat> this is not the, the end of the survey. We are um, near uh, the uh, point of, of moving forward on the alignment options um, and whittling down into actual recommended alignments for the three sections. Um, and we will be, again, sharing those with the community. The last thing I would remind everybody, um, the survey is available via text. Um, you text US 401 corridor to 73224. That's US 401 corridor to 73224 for those of you who are joining us on the phone. Um, and you can also, uh, on the main website, sign up for updates. Uh, and that's when you'll definitely know uh, when the um, recommendations are available. Okay, so we have um, lots of questions that have come in. I want to remind everybody, if you could, please post your questions um, in the question and answer panel. Um, it's much easier for us to keep an eye on uh, what's going on uh, with the questions and to try to categorize some of them. So I have already gone through just the first few um, and uh, have identified some that are more general and then some that are about specific segments. Um, I think, Mike, if my uh, hope is to start with um, some of the questions about the actual presentation, some of the more specific um, early, we early when you first started your presentation, we did get a few questions from people that, that you ended up answering in the presentation. So feel free um, to be a little shorter on the responses for those. Um, and then if folks continue to need to clarify, please do add that into the Q and A. So, Mike, one of the uh, original questions was about the distinction between this. Um, corridor study and the alignment options that we're presenting and it, um, uh, how it relates to the actual Campo MTP 2045 map. Um, I don't know. I think it, it's just as uh, good for you or Kenneth to answer this question about the um, MTP and what that is. So one thing I would let folks know is um, Metropolitan Transportation Plans are all on uh, Campo's website at www.campo-nc for North Carolina.us. And we'll put that in the chat as well. Kenneth, would you be able to distinguish, um, help people understand what this 401 study is and, and how it fits in with the MTP? Sure, thank you, Bonnie. Appreciate the questions that we are getting thus far. Uh, basically, with regard to the uh, 401 study, of course, from a historical standpoint, it had been incorporated in uh, early MTPs, as Mike had just mentioned. Uh, it was in one of the first original ones we did back in 2025, uh, not 2025, in 2002 for the 2025 uh, Long Range Transportation Plan, now recognized as the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. It was in that, but one of the things that was significant and this was even before um, uh, I had come on board. We had been included in the original uh, 1997 uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation uh, thoroughfare plan. And it uh, was a part of an amendment that was submitted back in, I believe, May 1999. And from that, it had been included and uh of those particular uh, metropolitan plans, long-range transportation plans, from each iteration we've gone from 2025 to 2045, which was just adopted in uh, 2017. Uh, in light of what was occurring in terms of uh, growth in this area following our Southwest Area Study, um, I'm fast-forwarding basically 20 years, <laughs> um, we uh, determined in conjunction with uh, the town of Fuquay Verena that it would be appropriate to really address this as a part of the U.S. You do a U.S. 401 corridor study in light of the fact that um, there was a desire to have a Fuquay uh, Verena Parkway as well as look at what would be a uh, U.S. 401 uh, future U.S. 401. 
And so we said, well, let's uh, really take a look at this area in light of what we are hearing and what we're seeing. And so that's the purpose and impetus behind the study. So it's not to make a, um, it, it's, it's basically an effort to really find and define what needs to be done in light of what has been captured over the decades in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, studies and long range transportation plans. So that's the purpose behind this. Perfect. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, along with that question, there were a number of um, projects that were presented earlier um, as also going on in the area. Um, and folks are also interested to know about uh, funding for the overall improvement and then uh, an actual uh, future 401 bypass of sorts. So can you, while we've got you, Kenneth, um, can you go ahead and speak to the the where this project fits among other projects that are programmed or not? And what does the fact that the project funding for this project look like? How does that process go? Okay. One of the most important thing is, one of the most important facets I need to indicate to you is this. Uh, before a project can ever be programmed, it must be included in what is called a fiscally constrained uh, metropolitan transportation plan. That's where all projects must come from. What we're doing at this particular moment in time, as an MPO in connection with our uh, our uh, partners in the Durham Chapel Carborough area uh, MPO, is we're putting together a regional uh, MPO that addresses a transportation system and transportation systems for this region as we look at it growing between now and 2050. So the next update will be uh, 2050. So once we have uh, all those projects addressed, and of course it goes through a process of, uh, of air quality conformity, and as I mentioned, again, being uh, physically constrained, meaning that there is money available to do these projects, we can then determine uh, of course, based on input from citizens, from the elected officials, uh, on how to pursue uh, funding for these projects. And then, of course, these projects, uh, once they are petitioned, we then go through a process of seeing how it will uh, score in our strategic uh, planning process called SPOT, and ultimately see how it can be prioritized ultimately to the point of being incorporated in a transportation improvement plan, improvement program. And then from that, uh, it will be scheduled out for planning, design, right of way, and construction. So those are the steps that we would, re that we are required to go through. And I must remem re remind people or mention to people again of the earlier slide that uh, Mike presented, which showed basically the project life cycle. So those are the things that we need to, yeah, that's the previous slide that just shown there. That is the steps that we have to go through in order to uh, bring a project to not only construction fruition, but also operations and uh, maintenance. So those are the things that we have to do in order to address, again, the transportation system. And again, I must emphasize, we're looking at this from the standpoint of a transportation system to meet the needs of a growing region uh, all the way to ultimately 2050 and even beyond. So that's what you say. Perfect segue. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, that's exactly the next uh, set of questions. I was going to actually um, go ahead and kick this one over to you, Mike, if you would, on the technical side. We have a few folks who are asking, um, and it, it was a little earlier as you were presenting, about some of the growth and those additional projects. Will you reiterate some of the um, points you were making earlier with regard to what we're seeing for forecast for growth um, and uh, the capacity of existing roads to manage that, but also even projects that are already funded or committed um, and, and uh, you know what's needed, what it looks like? Sure, not a problem, Bonnie. So as I, as I mentioned on this slide earlier, there are a lot of planned projects in this area. And when we look at 
the growth patterns and we look at the traffic patterns, we're taking all of these things into account that are part of the network. So we're looking at a complete network. Um, so all of the projects on here, we took into account as we looked at what's best for the 401 corridor, um, because really it's not just about a corridor. I always say you can do a quarter study, but it's really about everything beyond the quarter. It's not just about the corridor. And so all of these things are taken into account with the growth that's happening in the area. Um, and so with the growth that's happening in the area, with all of these projects, we're actually going to improve traffic flow. And we're actually going to improve travel times. Um, so we're, we're essentially, as we saw in one of the slides earlier, the 2045 model is, is predicting that the growth in the area is going to triple. So even with the population tripling and the, the you know, a lot more jobs closer in this area, um, thank you, Siobhan, for putting that back up. So the employment increase, the population increase, even with these things, we're still going to improve traffic with all of these, with all of these. So really, it's, it's all of these projects working in harmony and working together to create a better situation into the future as the growth patterns uh, happen. I uh, do like to forget to take myself off mute here. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, another one um, will be, we'll still go ahead and uh, stick with some of the more general alignment questions about the project. So, mm -hmm. um, but heading a little bit more into the alignment. Um, if folks are wondering how this, uh, the the improvements, but specifically the future um, uh, roadway known as potentially a bypass, does it hook into 540 in any way, or what will its connection be with 540? And is 540 um, and its capacity volumes, its future ability to uh, contribute to the transportation network, is that taken into account? So this roadway will not connect directly to 540, as as we showed in Shivang. If you want to go back to that previous slide, um, what we're what what, it, what we're looking at, our section is from Banks Road. So the, what we're looking at is a connection back into 401 at Banks Road. And so that's that's what this section is looking at. So no direct connection to NC540. Um, is NC540 taken into account in the traffic on NC540? Yes. And I actually think, Siobhan, bring up the, the map that shows where, yes, perfect. So you can see there, on there, the, all the sections of 540, and you can, you can see the 540 on there. All of the sections, so we're looking at this as if 540 was completed, both to the east and to the west. And so, we, yes, it is taken into account as part of the study. As again, we're, as we look at the network, we want to make sure that all roadways that are either under construction or into the future are included in the network. And so when we do the modeling, we're looking at the complete network. Okay, great. Um, and while we are in the Banks Road area, uh, can we, and there were a few here with regard to that. I'm sorry, I just had some. Uh, so I think I'm in the, is A2 in the um, Banks Road area. For the Wake uh, County area, and even for the uh, potential bypass area, are known developments taken into account? Will you speak to the um, analysis and data one more time on that? Yep, sure. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now, as, as Shivang put up, thank you, Shivang, is the what we're calling Section A, which is the section between existing 401 and NC42. If you look in there closely and you look at the brown, it says it's active or planned development. So it's either development under construction or development that's going to happen. Um, development that's already completed or is already there. So we're not showing those because those are obviously taken into account already. And so we're looking at anything that's active or planned right now. Um, so yes, we are taking those developments into account. The other thing I want to mention too that I did not mention earlier is we tried to anywhere we could to go down property lines. We didn't want to go through major parts of properties. We wanted to try and go down property lines because if we can go down property lines, um, that'll have minimal effects to more properties than if we went through a property. So we tried in these alignments or these alternatives to try and go down property lines wherever we could. Um, an example of that is A4 and A5. As you can see there, um, while Hilltop Road kind of goes to the middle of that planned development, A4 and A5 is to the extreme right side of that development. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we're not going through areas that either are currently being developed or could future be developed. So we, we want to try and leave as much property for, for folks to be able to develop if they want to. Perfect. Um, 
say that going back to, to the high level again, the um, do the selection of some of the alignments, the way they're shown on the map. Um, if you say go with C6, would it then impact C5? Or um, the way they're drawn, can you, since they're broken up into segments, can they be chosen in segments um, or put together, kind of mixed and matched? How will, would an ultimate alignment look? Will it definitely be a continuous line as we see it now, or could it be pieces of the segments, different segments? It really could be pieces of the segments. And that would be part of the phase three, that if we find that maybe the best segment or of each section are not necessarily connecting, we will figure out a way that they can connect or one of the best ways that they can connect. That's the reason we really feel that these are almost three distinct things that we can work out in phase three. And so it's really, uh, it will be a combination of of the three sections. They don't necessarily have to connect right now for, for us to be to select them into the preferred alternative in phase three. Because each section has its own constraints. There's different, you know, there, there's more, like for instance, in section B, there's more cemeteries. You know, it's those sorts of things. There, there's certain constraints. There's more environmental features in section B. Um, you know, there's more property impacts and, you know, maybe in section A. So we're, it's, it's really depends on the feedback we get from the survey and what's important in each section. Okay, um, and then uh, getting a little bit more into the granular, um, folks are wondering um, if these lines in the future, at what point in that bigger process would the lines get all the way down to really knowing um, property impact or exactly where they would where they would go? Um, my understanding is that's not specifically going to that level of detail isn't specifically going to come out of this project because of future project development. Do we have some ideas It's sort of like the next big phase of, of planning or is it a little bit further from that even? To, to get to... And Kenneth, oh, go ahead, Mike. No, no, I, I, Kenneth, do you want to answer this one? Or you want me to take it? Go ahead, go ahead and take it, yes. Okay, so when we're getting down to where we're trying to find, figure out exactly what the impacts are, that is really going to be more in the project development to design stage. So you're looking at really those two stages here. We do need, the, you know, a preferred alternative um, on the map as what's shown in the MTP to be able to move forward into the programming and funding. But really getting down to individual property impacts is more going to be in that project development and design stage. Okay, and we're going to keep on that for two other um, specific questions. Um, and and I want to. Um, back Mike up uh, as well in, in supporting that, um, you know, we can't predict exactly what um, each future study is going to include, uh, but that is what we anticipate and that's typical of the project development phases. Um, the Mike, one of the questions here is how will, will there be a cost uh, analysis done down the road um, that that then USDOT or CAMPA would look at more specifically um, on the overall project. Yes, when we get to preferred alternatives, so when we when we select preferred alternatives in phase three um, as part of the implementation process and taking it to the programming and funding, the next one is we, we will be doing cost estimates. Uh, cost estimates are part of getting into Kenneth mentioned the spot program. Um, uh, earlier, in order to, to get projects into the spot program, one of the things that we need to look at as part of those is not just impacts, but also costs. And so that's information that gets put in along with the projects into that program. Great. Uh, along those lines for future process, um, can, uh, Kenneth, would you go into a little bit about the, um, especially for the future roadway, uh, what the processes look like in terms of doing an environmental analysis. We've seen some different comments about the streams, and a lot of us may recall the uh, 540 environmental process. Can you speak a little bit to uh, whether or not additional planning is done on that, but also how this study did look at those things as well? One of the things I'll just briefly mention is um, one of the things, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically it goes through a NEPA process where we look to gain concurrence uh, 
<laughs> and that's a lot of information. But basically, one of the things we do go through the, that environmental process to determine, uh, uh, find the uh, least impactful alternative for uh, this particular project. So uh, as we get uh, and go into that program phase, that's one of the things that we uh, want to do because we do want to find the least impactful uh, alternative for uh, the, uh, for the project. So ultimately, that's one of the things that we do. But to make a long story short, that's uh, that's one of the steps that we have to go through as we go forward. Okay. And then, uh, thanks, Kenneth. One of the other uh, common questions that we're seeing, and then we're probably going to uh, keep diving deeper, is the um, relationship. We talked about 540 a few times now with the Fuquay um some folks are referring to it to, as the expressway. Um, some are referring to a, an eastern parkway, and other folks are referring to a Fuquay parkway. Can you guys clarify um, what this roadway may be that folks are talking about and how it relates to the existing 401 or future 401? Yep, I, I can take that. So we, we call it on here the Fuquay Verena Eastern Parkway on this slide. Um, it's also called the Fuquay Verena Parkway. Um, what it's what its intention is to connect neighborhoods and future neighborhoods in this area of Fuquay, east of downtown. Um, it's really intended to be more of a boulevard and not a necessarily a mover. What we're, when you look at classification of roadways, um, this is really considered more of you know, a local serving a local area, whereas US 401 is more of a regional, it's serving the region. And so that's really the intention of the two roadways. We do take both of the roadways into account as we did our modeling. So. We, we didn't look at one or the other. We looked at them together and, you know, realized that um, they work in harmony with each other because they're actually serving two different purposes. Okay. And then, Mike, this one's kind of specific. So, folks, um, please don't let me confuse things for those uh, who are not as interested in the answer to this question. Kind of uh, close your ears for a second. Mike, um, we do have a question. Uh, asking, we've actually got a few around the six lanes. Can you, are you able, I can't remember, to point out where there are potentially alignments that would have six lanes in the overall 19 miles? So mm -hmm. the, literally folks are asking, uh, uh, through the 19 miles, are there alignments that would make either existing or future six lanes? The only place on this entire 19 miles, including and then including the seven miles of the future 401 section, the only place we're looking at six lanes is between banks and 55 along existing 401. Um, this would include the intersections of Hilltop Needmore, Lake Wheeler Road, White Roland Road, the future Fuquay Verena Parkway, Banks Road. And the reason why is because the, the again, the network, the travel patterns are showing you know, there's a lot of traffic that's coming into this area via either Lake, Lake Wheeler or via Hilltop Needmore. And so it's necessitated to be a six lane section through here. Um, there's actually a project going on right now that NCD is, is looking at, as I mentioned, the Hilltop Extension Project, where they're removing Hilltop Road from the Hilltop Needmore intersection and bringing it in at another point on 401 to increase safety, but not only to increase traffic flow, but also increase safety at that intersection, because that's a that's a pretty crazy five way intersection there at Hilltop Needmore. And so this is really a long answer to a short question. It's the only section we're looking at six lanes is in that area. Now you can see that on this map uh, right here. It's in that yellow area. We're not looking at six lanes anywhere else, in, anywhere in the score, in the study area. Okay. And um, Kenneth, I'm going to throw this one to you. Uh, we may, if we have colleagues um, from uh, Fuquay, Verena, or Wake, you're welcome to chime in. Um, but Kenneth, can you help a little bit with uh, speaking to improvements on existing roads, um, and I think this to a certain extent includes maintenance for roads like Judd, Park, Judd Parkway um, and others in the area that may not have already been listed with identified projects. Is that, did, was that a clear question? <laughs> even if we spend, even if we spend money um, first of all, are there improvements that are planned to some of the big infrastructure arterials in the area? And then secondly, it looks like the question is, um, you know, I think we've answered this part, but, but have we done everything to improve existing roadways to meet future demand? 
um, therefore that would therefore make the future 401 unnecessary. Um, but you can, can uh, is there any way to speak to, to improving and maintaining existing uh, infrastructure, local roadways? Uh, I would defer that to uh, town of Fuqua Arena staff who are uh, panelists. They're welcome to talk about that. I know that uh, it's for state roads and local roads. And so uh, I, I think from the standpoint of uh, Fuqua Arena works in conjunction with the state and, uh, on their roadway network, uh, they can uh, probably better speak to that. So town of Fuqua Arena staff, if you all wish to provide input concerning that, that would be greatly appreciated. And while they're, um, uh, you know, figuring out technology over here as well, because this is a bit confusing setup, um, there are, uh, we did deal, there are a number of questions still with regard to growth, kind of going to the same um, thing and the need for this. I think a lot of that's been in the presentation, um, and we've done a couple questions on it. Uh, but if there are more specific things about where we are technically, um, with the analysis or these alignments, please feel free to keep uh, clarifying some of those. Uh, we have a few questions that relate to um, what we call the multimodal side of things or bike, ped, and buses. Um, one of them is specifically, does anybody know about a sidewalk uh, around the uh, 42 intersection um, and and are there intersection improvements, safety improvements that are included in this? And maybe uh, Mike, if Siobhan might show a couple of those slides. Yeah, so, you know, we our, our goal here is to improve bike ped connections anywhere we can. And if we can do that as part of this project, we'd like to. Um, you know, as far as going on to the other roadways off of 401, we, you know, we are looking at parallel um, bike ped connections in certain places, downtown uh, Fuquay Arena, um, other places in Harnett County. So we're always looking for ways to be able to connect bike ped to others. So if they're close enough, they'll probably be um, looked at. You know, as we get more into the preferred alternative, we'll be looking closer at those specific bike ped connections. And those things will come more into light as the projects go into the future. You know, that's something that we look even closer at project development and design to make sure that those connections are happening. Um, the other thing, too, is that it's a, it also um, bike peg coordinations are also uh, not to use the word coordination all the time, but they are done in coordination with the municipalities and the counties. And so the municipalities and the counties will have their input into it as well um, to be able to create those connections. It's it's part of the complete streets you know, um, policy that NCDOT has put together, we want to start looking at more of those multimodal connections. So as we get further into the project, into that project life cycle, those things will be looked at more closely. I don't know if we'll be able to answer those full questions as part of this study, Bonnie, though, because we're really looking more at those preferred alternatives. We'll, we'll, we'll try and look at those things as best we can, but really the next stages is where we'll get more in depth and deeper into those connections. Exactly. I think this next answer is going to be similar. I'll go ahead and just sort of um, respond to it in order to keep us moving through time-wise, but uh, there is a question about the multi-use pathways and what does that mean, literally. Um, uh, multi-use pathways are uh, mean that uh, multiple user types can use them. They tend to be wider, um, 8, to 14, 15 feet um, even, and, and uh, when they are going through the woods or different areas, we call them greenways and and uh, oftentimes when it's a side path, you'll see it like oftentimes more like asphalt instead of concrete. Those are called multi-use paths. And yes, they do include cyclists and um, pedestrians, you know, wheelchair strollers, dogs, everybody. But um, for the purposes of this study, I think that the point of the cross sections was a lot about the amount of width and what what could go in there in terms of bike and ped um, and some of your safety measures, uh, a lot of exactly whether or not that's going to be some sort of painted lane and then uh, a separate path in exactly four feet or six feet on some of those elements does get decided a lot later. They, these plans will have uh, some recommendations around that, but it won't be extensive. It's not going to be a final um Final plan, Mike or, or Kenneth, I'll give you a second while I look for the next question here to um, add in anything there. 
I mean, it's like you said, Bonnie, a multi-use path is really meant for all users. Um, it's, you know, all, and like I mentioned earlier, there's different type of bicycle users. There's ones that use bicycle more for recreation or commuting. And then there's, you know, we want to make sure there's places where, you know, even children can ride their bicycles, but it's also for all users, pedestrians, um, anyone that can use it. We, we want to provide connections that are not just vehicular connections. And so that would, that would be used for that purpose. Hey, Bonnie, Tracy and then, um, in to follow up on the question you asked a few a few minutes ago regarding I think maintenance and expansion projects and that kind of thing, if I understood the gist of that question. Um, yeah, sorry, and, Tracy. This is Tracy from Pukeway, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and Hi. Kent um, and Mike, amen or uh, redirect if I if I say something that you guys don't agree with. But um, essentially, you know, the approach we have taken from the start is, you know, we spent a good bit of uh, effort and money in the central part of town trying to be able to handle traffic through the central part. It kept, keeps becoming apparent is the amount of commuter traffic in the corridor going through our downtowns is just not sustainable in the future. And so, you know, there's a few projects in the hopper to including this one to try to help disperse that in places where we're just not going to be able to expand in a way that's going to handle it all. You know, I, I saw some of the comments that said it would just expand Judd Parkway, expand 401 through town. And there's just some physical constraints on all that that's going to prevent us being able to bring all that commuter traffic through the core and get it out in a reasonable manner, no matter how much widening we do. Um, and so, um, you know, our approach has been to incrementally work through projects, be it interchange, intersection, you know, segments of projects. So. Pretty much all of this is going to be a, a future, you know, we're going to work on pieces of this to improve as, as time goes on. And we see this study as the, you know, trying to determine what some of those pieces are for us so that we can actually make this work. Um, I think in general, um, and I know there was a maintenance component to that question. And I think, you know, if we're talking about physical maintenance of the roadways, that's that's different. Um, you know, that's that's handled by but a lot of that's handled by DOT or by us on, on separate uh, um, avenues. But I think long and short, you know, I see, you know, some of this stuff about I know there are some questions about, well, if you expand um, a lot of the roads in the area and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for the most part, the MTP includes expanding most of these roadways to the sections that people are talking about and the traffic still bears out that we're not going to be able to handle it even with those expansions unless we do something different. Um, I know there was a lot of question about Fuquay Verena Parkway, which was Eastern Parkway a long time ago, but Wayne County did uh, prompt us and make us rename it Fuquay Verena Parkway. They did not because um, there are some existing pieces of that. And so it is it is definitely Fuquay Verena Parkway. Um, and again, every analysis that we've done thus far says that even with the 401 work, there's still a utility for uh, this to be able to handle traffic. And it is, in fact, you know, some of that is constructed in some of our existing developments. So um, so I think, you know, I was trying to be succinct, but there was a lot of a lot of stuff wrapped up in that question. Um, but my take on most everything is that, you know, we are looking at this comprehensively including this work, but also expanding everything that needs to be expanded to try to handle everything. And we consistently keep seeing that, you know, an additional amount of capacity is needed in order to make, you know, the future work. Thank you, Tracy. And feel free to, um, uh, you know, continue to pop in as we answer or respond to some of these uh, additional questions. I think we're uh, over halfway through questions, but I uh, I think it's nice to hear somebody else's voice every once in a while. And I know we do have at least one elected official on the call. We may have more because so many of you have shared your first names, but I I can't uh, identify everyone. I know, though, I believe um, Representative Pare, and I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly, um, was on and uh, had her hand raised. So I wanted to try to unmute you. There you are. Um, if yeah, I'm sending you a request to unmute now, Representative, and hopefully that will work. Is that, can you hear me and can you talk? Yes, I'm here and I can hear you. Uh, you cut out for about 
three seconds. Your mouth was moving and I didn't hear what was coming out of it. So I'm not sure what you said there, but I am here. So thank you for calling on me. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Um, I know you had your hand raised. And so we wanted to get to make sure to, to give you a chance to say something. I know time is often tight in your world. Go ahead, please. That is true. So thank you. I, I just had a really quick kind of small question, but it matters a lot to me. We talked a lot about survey results and how you take into account some of the comments from the public on this. It's a really, really important topic, as you know, for a lot of people, if they're coming from the traffic congestion standpoint to the property owner standpoint. So I wanted to, to just ask you and encourage you, but also ask you if those survey results or the in, input from the surveys are going to be made public. Oh, for sure. Um, so we will post all of the comments. Um, in fact, over the next day or two, I'll be posting a bunch of comments for another survey on another project. Um, we, it's a habit to post all the comments. They will all be included in the appendices. Comments from that first round of engagement are, um, there's a public engagement summary online on that 401 quarter website right now. And so, yes, um, not only can you see summaries, not only can you see presentation slides, um, around what the summaries were, but we do include all the comments, um, because we also go through all the comments and we think it's important. Um, that's not just us. That's a good practice of making sure that your electeds and your decision makers our partners in the towns and in the county all see um, the variety of comments coming in because it can be so subjective to summarize them. So we definitely share all that. Very good. Well, I appreciate that. And thank you for taking public input into serious consideration. This is nothing short of life-changing for a lot of people on this call. And, and I, I know that they and I appreciate their um, comments and their concerns being taken very seriously. So thank you so much. Sure. Um, and with that, can't hear you, Bonnie. Oh, you guys. Um, so uh, thank you, Representative Pari, for, for joining us tonight um, and for, for sharing your concerns, thoughts, um, and uh, question around transparency. We're going to shift back over into the multimodal questions again. We've got a couple others. I will let you know I see a number still on safety and bicyclists, um, and, uh, and I'm going to, I think we've responded to those. If there's something specific, please throw another question in. Um, but I was going to swap over to um, buses. Does anybody know, um, but Mike or Kenneth, I think this is a, we'll stick with Mike on this one. For transit, do you have some idea or will this study be recommending any transit priority um, or different things that would help make it make not only um, commuter lines, um, but, but would help uh, transit? move quickly and efficiently through the corridor in the future. Is that going to be part of recommendation? Yes, it very well could be. You know, what we're proposing as a recommendation as part of this is to extend express service. That's already going to Wake Tech, extend that down into Fuquay and potential extensions through Holly Springs and Apex. Um, there could also be a potential for, you know, eventually a bus on shoulder or something else that we can do to get you know, buses through if quicker into this corridor. I don't believe this section was included on the bus and shoulder study, but it could be something that into the future, there's there's a lot of time between now and when, you know, some of these improvements are gonna happen to really, you know, put transit in, in part of this. Um, but from a ridership standpoint, what we're seeing uh, from the models is that, you know, the express bus service is gonna serve a lot of the, a lot of the community that would use transit. Okay, great. Um, I think those are the main um, questions and uh, bike uh, transit and bike questions, transit being bus and, and rail. Um, so we're going to hop back. Um, uh, we have a number of questions around things like historic properties and cemeteries. Um, would you prioritize a cemetery over housing um, or property lines, things like that? 
uh, and I just want to, um, I think that question, uh, in my opinion, uh, has been answered. And the answer at this point is that is actually what we are trying to um, identify now. There are obviously protections around certain historic properties and things like that 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 um, are going to impact any alignment. Um, and a lot of that has been uh, logged already. Um, but with regard to prioritization, we are, we're really asking folks to um, weigh in on exactly that um, so that decision makers can make a decision that is as reflective of the community as possible um, because there are trade-offs among these alignments. And uh, there are going to be trade-offs for almost any future um, roadways that we're looking at. Um, okay. And so, Bonnie, let me just, Bonnie, uh, let me just add oh, to that ahead, real, real quick. So I want to make a point that, you know, we, when we were doing this or when we get to that point of, you know, when the road is, is designed and things like that, we have to go through all the, all, we have to go through all the regulatory agencies. So, you know, the state historic preservation office, um, you know, the, the division of water quality, those, those types of regulatory agencies. And so we can't design or look at this in a vacuum without having to go um, realize that those are our partners as part of this project. Some of those people are on our stakeholder oversight team. We've, we've already talked with some of those about this so that they're aware, you know, that we're looking at certain things. And so we're, we're not ignoring that part of it. We understand that um, while we're looking at all these hard constraints, if we do affect any of these things, we still have to go through the regulatory agencies with the state. Perfect. Um, going back into some of the process stuff, uh, folks are wondering, would the bypass occur sooner than, let's say, some of these improvements on the 401 corridor, of the existing 401, or um, what would the order of that of that be? And Kenneth, I'll go ahead and, and ask you to answer that one again, existing 401 potential recommended projects and the bypass. Any idea what the overall order would look like of that? Uh, not at this particular time. I know that uh, as we uh, continue to study, of course, it has to be, uh, as mentioned earlier, it has to be uh, scored and uh, based, you know, looking at project costs and various uh, uh, elements associated with that for processing. And then from there, we can determine, uh, the region will determine based on the, those inputs as to how these projects are will be prioritized. So. Uh, a lot will go into the process of determining uh, how uh, a future 401 versus other uh, segments has been described will be uh, processed should they all go forward at, uh, at the same time. And, and I do want to add on to that, you know, phase four of this project is looking at implementation. And so we will be trying to answer those questions or, you know, that those, you know, time, the timing as best as we can as we look at that. Uh, and the other thing is a lot of these projects will go through uh, for a, a larger regional and then statewide um, project uh, prioritization process through NCDOT. Um, occasionally, uh, these, some of these, especially the sidewalk and uh, greenway or, or side path decisions would be heavily involving um, the local jurisdictions. But um, ultimately, a lot of these projects will, will quote, compete again, uh, other projects. So it, it, uh, the state funding and what all that looks like, you know, also impacts um, the order of how these things get built. Um, okay. With regard to the um, reduced conflict intersection, Mike, I know we have a, a slide on that, um, but it, we do have a couple questions of folks that, that are curious again about the um, the value of cutting off um, cross cross street left turn. Um, will you would you mind hop, speaking of that again, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's there's two you know big uh, benefits of the of the RCI, and and the first one is reduced conflicts. I mean, it's in the name. Um, a regular intersection has anywhere between twenty eight and thirty two conflict points. What this does is it spreads those conflict points out. Um, it's actually safer to make a right turn and a U-turn than it is to make a left turn. 
I mean, it, studies have sh- have proven that. Studies have shown that it's it's been you know the the subject of you know traffic and transportation studies for decades now. Um, looking at that and how to make the roads safer. So from the first standpoint, it's just a lot safer condition, especially when you have a lower volume road connecting to a higher volume road. Um, that's the first thing from a safety standpoint. The second thing is it just it makes traffic flow better as well. Um, so it's again, if from a traffic flow perspective, sometimes it's easier to make a right turn and a U-turn than to make a left turn. Um, it's all, and, and it, again, it has to do with the lower volumes on the side roads and the higher volumes on the, on the main road. It also keeps the, what we call the platoons or cars that go together from, you know, it could be from signals or just happen to be in groups together. It lets those platoons move through intersections a lot smoother. And so it really has two major benefits, both from a traffic flow perspective and from a safety perspective, but reduce conflicts in the name. Safety is the name of the game. It, it makes these intersections a lot, a lot safer. Thank you. Um, so uh, another one with regard to a quick one, uh, Kenneth, do you know if this is slated, uh, would it just be funded at the straight out of, and this is speaking to the future 401 um, uh, roadway, uh, how would that be funded in terms of, is it possible that it would end up being a toll road? I'm not aware of it. Being a uh, total road, have have about that just from an anecdotal standpoint. But uh, uh, we can see this uh, if we look at uh, the Roseville bypass. Uh, there was a funding option that was made available for it in order for it to be built. I could see it on those from that particular standpoint. I uh, seriously doubt that it would be a a toll road. Uh, Based on its very nature and uh, and and other factors, so I, I kind of doubt that. I see a more of a a different type of funding uh, pot for that uh, particular facility. Okay, um, we have a few uh, logistical or technical questions. Just want to make sure that folks um, are aware. The again, we are uh, maps are available online at the US 401. It's not the let me state that clearly. It's the U.S. <laughs> Master Online at www.us401corridorstudy.com. Um, they can be zoomed in to a certain extent, again, because the, um, the full uh, extent of these alignments uh, would be further developed a little bit more into the study, but really largely in future project development. We also, but the maps are online and are available there. If you want to see the um, uh, Metropolitan Transportation Plan or MTP map, um, those are at uh, campo, C-A-M-P-O dash N-C dot U-S. want to reiterate again that um, uh, this meeting is being recorded. It will be posted online. We are also going to post um, the comments that came in through Q&A, we'll put um, a, like a spreadsheet or a listing of the questions that came in here. And as we mentioned a few moments ago with the representative, um, the survey uh, information will also be posted and it does not close until September 24th. So uh, analysis and everything will take a little bit longer uh, well into October before we're able to post all of that. Um, we do have a few different comments and questions about um, mostly comments about um, slowing growth or stopping growth, um, and um, specifically for both Harnett County and Wake County. Um, I, obviously, I, I, those um, I will I want to acknowledge that we're receiving uh, comments to that effect. Um, this study is you know is simply going with the the true forecasts that we're seeing based on local plans um, uh, and and things like that. Um, the the actual growth land use type decisions type decisions uh, occur through other studies and other other projects. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to pass that one um, to others. And we're getting toward. If I could ask the project team um, if, the, if to highlight questions that I've missed. Um, we do have questions, uh, again, re- with regard to the timing of the overall project out to construction. 
Um, Mike gave an idea earlier that that uh, projects like this um, take decades. Uh, hopefully, existing 401 improvements would occur uh, sooner. But um, all of that, there's still additional um, environmental review. There's additional specific planning and engineering work. Uh, working with property owners and right of way acquisition is needed. That all, there are still um, a lot of years of work to be done before a new road would be constructed. Um, so, uh, but but getting further into properties that would be impacted, um, it, you know, comes bit by bit. Uh, as these projects, as these studies continue to move forward. At this point, um, the alignments are not super granular. And Mike, did you want to add something to that? I do. Uh, I saw some questions on the alignments themselves, uh, two specifically, one about using existing roads and the second one about the Section C alignment. So if I can answer those questions, I'd like to, because um, I think they're important questions that we that we want to answer. Um, so we heard you from phase one. A lot of the phase one comments uh, that you mentioned, and we did get a lot of these comments, is why don't you use existing roads uh, for the 401, uh, future 401 section? And so what we did was we actually created alignments that were using existing roads. And, and I'm glad that Siobhan put this one back up, the A3 to B3 to C3. Those are all existing roadways. So that is having the alignment along existing roadways. And we did do a study on the impacts on the existing of, of having the alignment on existing roadways versus alignments on new sections or new areas or not, you know, areas where there aren't roadways. And what we found is actually going along the existing roadways has more impacts, more property impacts than um, than some other ones. As you can see in that top one, if you if you look on the left side of this, A3 has their kind of a middle of property impacts, B3 and C3 has the most property and it's, it's in that most property impact category. So we did do ex what we were asked to do as part of this as part of the technical analysis. And we did look at using existing roads for this alignment and it actually creates more property impacts. Um, the other question I wanna answer has to do with why the Fuqua Verena Parkway is separate in section A and section B, but not in section C. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, when, when the MTP line was planned, it does, um, it, it included that southern section of the Fuqua Verena Parkway, which is C1. Um, if you can, see, if you're looking at the map, it's that section C1. Um, the reason why it's not together in A and B, and it is together in C, is because there's a lot less traffic in the model in C. Um, we don't see the effect of needing both the roadways in C because what we're seeing is there's a, a lot of the traffic patterns right now, the way that a lot of them occur is a lot of traffic comes down 401 and disperses off on the 42 and 55. So it's it's the, the future 401 section is as much about getting traffic to those two roadways as it is to getting it around Fuqua Verena and Harnett County. And so the A and B, you need both those roads. They serve different purposes where in the C and the section C, they really serve a very similar purpose because there's just less traffic in that area. Now we're trying, the reason we were looking at different alternatives in that area is because we want to connect it to that, you know, to a higher level roadway like, like Piney Grove Rawls Road, because a lot of traffic does use Piney Grove Rawls Road. And so connecting it to there makes some, makes logical sense from a traffic perspective. Um, and then that's why we also brought up in, when we talked about section B, the potential of not having the, the future 401 section in section C and connecting to the 55, and your Western bypass down to NC210. So that is an option um, and something that did come out of conversations and you know from things we heard from the public before as well. So there are you know some options in that area, but it made sense for those two roads to be together in the section C, but not in the A and B sections. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we have a few uh, questions with regard to what would the speed limit be on a future 401 area. And so uh, the existing 401 doesn't, is not anticipated to change at this point. Um, the future 401 would likely be signed at a, a speed of 55 miles per hour. But again, that is something that would be um, uh, determined uh, down the road. Um, it would be a, a more uh, freeway style roadway. Yeah, Can I and, answer that and correctly? That is, that's yeah. correct. We are looking, our design speed uh, that we're looking at is 60 miles an hour. You typically design your roadways at five miles per hour over the posted speed limit. 
And so the what we're what we're suggesting right now is that the post speed limit be 55 in the future section. And ke- yes, you are correct on the existing 401 section, keeping the speed limits as they are. Um, one thing I also want to mention, you asked earlier about six lane roads. Um, and someone did point out in the, I couldn't remember if it was in the QA or in the chat, that they remember seeing six lane roadways. That is correct. The the original, the MTP actually does show the future 401 section as a six lane roadway. What we are seeing through this study is that it doesn't need to be six lanes. It's fine being four lanes. So yes, that is a change from what you've seen before. So whoever made that comment, very astute. Um, but we, uh, through our study and through our analysis, we are seeing that six lanes is not needed, but four lanes is. So I just wanted to point that out also, Bonnie. Thanks, Mike. Um, you guys, I want to uh, make sure before we hit eight o'clock here, we do have a few people who have called in and I want to make sure uh, it, phone callers may not be able to actually chat or post in the Q&A. Um, so I am just very briefly going to ask you callers, uh, I'm going to individually try to unmute you. If you do um, want to ask a question, if you could ask it as briefly as possible, um, similar to folks who've done it in the Q&A and chat, tends to be a couple sentences or so. Um, but I'm starting with a number that's 919-348. And the second number I'm going to unmute, and I'll let you know that, is 919 So if you have the 348 number, I'm going to try to unmute you and ask you if you would like to um, uh, uh, you know, ask a question. I do not see that. Oh, there you go. Nine one nine three four eight. There you go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Please go ahead with your question. Okay, I'm specifically interested in the combination four hundred one bypass Speedway Partway that is slated to run from Rogers Road, across Andrew Road, across um, some fields that used to belong to the Scott family, across my family farm, which it would split it in two, then on across Purpley Road. Is that still on the books? Do we know the alignment uh, that she's referring to? It's uh, my, Mike, I'll give that one to you at this point. My guess is that it's the existing C1, as we mentioned earlier. It's the existing alignment on the MTP. Um, and that is why we're looking at different alternatives in this area, because the different alternatives have different trade-offs. And so, you know, most likely those other alternatives don't affect they will not affect the same properties um, as each other. And so that's why we're looking at these alternatives. So if you have specific comments on these, just let us know what those comments are, but I, I believe she's talking about the C1 alignment. Mike, Tracy Stevenson, okay. again, you've got a couple right of, there. you got a couple of things going on to uh, in that, uh, that alignment sounds like the existing um, Pequay CTP alignment for, East, uh, for Pequay Barina Parkway as well. And so there is an existing alignment in our transportation plan for Fuqua and Parkway. Um, this study would potentially change that depending upon what the final answers are that, that comes out of this. Um, but that does likely exist from Rogers across Purfoy back to 55 in, in our current CTP. Um, there are, you do have a couple of questions about, you know, what is that going to be, you know, where 401 and uh, Fuqua Marina Parkway are together there. Um, from our standpoint, you know, we we determined, um, you know, if if 401 gets built there, we don't need another parallel parkway there. And I think that you answered that earlier. Um, yep. There were a couple of questions regarding does it exist in South Lakes and um, I believe it's Elliott's Landing. There is a right of way reserved through both of those developments for um, Fuqua Marina Parkway and some uh, two-lane pieces of Fuqua Marina Parkway are constructed in um, South Lakes and North Lakes. So, um, you know, so you've got two different things going on, at least from what's on our CTP versus what's going on in the study. Um, and certainly, you know, the study uh, has the potential to impact um, our CTP going forward. 
Thanks, Tracy. Um, that's very helpful information. Um, and you've knocked another question out there for the um, Eastern Parkway, Fuquay, Verena Parkway, Fuquay Parkway. Um, we do uh, have another caller, 919-601. Did you um, have a question that you wanted to ask? And then next would be 919-796. And again, we are uh, enabling these folks to ask their questions um, but, uh, because the chat function may not be an option. So 919-601, um, it looks like you're there. Do you want to go ahead with a question? Yeah. Um, my question is, what is the next? Step for community input and discussion based on the further findings. What's going to be next? Uh, Mike, uh, I, I don't think that's as much of a question about public engagement. It's what's the next phase of the project. Will you do that one? I can, yes. And, and I'll even go into the public engagement. So there will be another public. So here, let me take a step back. Phase three is where we're going to take um, all the technical analysis that we've done. So this is the this is essentially the completion of phase two. So we're taking we've developed solutions. We looked at technical analysis where we're asked, you know, we, we have the survey. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the information from this and then move into developing preferred alternatives, which is phase three. At the end of phase three, we will have another public engagement. And so um, we will allow the public again to, to have a conversation about this uh, about this entire study. And so you'll have another opportunity to engage with us, um, you know, anyone else on the CTT and SOT as part of this project. So um, there will be another round of public engagement. Okay, and I think we are, uh, did I unmute? Yeah, I think we're on to the 919-796 number. And next is going to be the 919-272 number. If you are the 796 number, I do not see the unmute happening. And so while they work on that, uh, or maybe choose not to, 919272 is the next number that we will, uh, uh, that we've unmuted if you're, um, if you have a question. And then we have another 919796 number. Um, that's on the screen here. So uh, I've unmuted that one as well. Maybe between the two, uh, it'll work. Um, and otherwise, I think I think we're good on the callers. I'm gonna. I see the nine one nine three four eight three four eight number. The initial um, person that we talked to appears to want to follow on with that question. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and unmute you. Nine one nine three four eight. There you yeah, go. Did I you had a follow-up. Follow okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Earlier, earlier in the discussion, uh, it was mentioned that you try to follow property lines when you figure out the alignment. Yet, for years now, we've tried to get the town to agree to do that. But we've been told that when it involves when it involves NCDOT funding, there cannot be any bends or curves in the road. And I have a problem with that answer. Um, you know, previously, the land near us was uninhabited. Our property has four houses and 16 people living on it. So why can they not? move the roadway to the property line and not divide this farm in two. And can I just clarify, are you speaking to the the um, future Fuquay Parkway or are you referring well, to the 401 um, future US 401 bypass area? Well, well, the markings that we've been shown on the map combine the 401 bypass with the Pequay Parkway. Initially, it was just the Pequay Parkway. Then in April, we find out, you know, that there's also now a 401 bypass. And they are supposedly, you know, running together, dividing this particular piece of property in half. 
So, so okay. Bonnie, as I mentioned earlier, this is the C1 alternative. Siobhan, can you go back to that map again? Do you mind? She's, she's talking about the C1 alternative, which does combine the MTP Future 401 line with the Fequay Verena Parkway town line. So that is correct. Um, and what I can do is I can answer the question about that we do have to adhere to roadway standards. Um, as I mentioned earlier, whatever the posted speed limit is, we have to adhere to the design standards of, of the roadway to be five miles per hour higher. And so if there's curvature, we need to, there's minimum curvature that we do need to meet uh, when we do design these roadways. And there are times where we have, we have to meet those standards in order for vehicular vehicles, especially trucks that would be using this road to traverse these roadways. And so, you know, if that's what they were mentioning, if that's what the town was mentioning is that there are places where we need to have curves that do meet standards, that's probably what they were talking about. Um, and again, I will mention, you know, C1, while it's a line on the map now, that's what we're looking for in the study. That's the point of this study. We want to make sure we, we are going to, one thing we're looking at here is to make sure that that's the line that's going to be on the map into the future. Um, we are working closely with the town on this to make sure that if we need to have two separate lines as needed, we will, if that's the end result. But really, we, you know, the, the goal here is to have one. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a coordination where we're working closely with the town to make sure we're meeting the needs of both the town and the region, as I mentioned earlier, and why we need both the roadways in the section A and the section B areas. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, because of the less amount of traffic between 55 to existing 401, that's why they were combined in this area. Um, Mike, we have a, a three or four questions left. Um, Ms. Kristen, I see that you have your hand raised, and I want to make sure to acknowledge that. Uh, I also um, know that you have a few uh, um, comments or questions, really, in the chat. And so we have uh, some other ones that haven't been answered yet. And then if you hang on with us, I will uh, open the line to you here a little bit later. Um, but we are nearing our uh, initial 8 o'clock uh, close time, and we want to get to these questions um, and make sure we've answered community questions as best we can. Uh, we do have a question right now with regard to the criteria. Um, is there a separation of how we are um, going to prioritize uh, when it comes to property impact in, by property type? Are we um, looking at agricultural different from residential, from non-residential? And, and I just want to clarify, Mike, I assume that the answer is, is that's exactly what we're looking at right now, but I want to make sure if there's more to add to that, that you do uh, have the chance to do that. So, Mike, I'm going to throw that your way. Yes, we are looking at impacts for different types of land uses. Um, so when we talk about property impacts, we're not talking general property impacts. We're talking about residential impacts, agricultural impacts, commercial impacts, industrial impacts. Um, so it's we are breaking them down into categories and from the survey and from the comments, we can then weight them as people, you know, as, as we get the majority of comments, the majority of, of folks answering the survey, we can move forward into, you know, what's more important to the public. So, yes, we are doing that. OK, great. Um, and then uh, can we hop into a specific um, uh, section A2? This is the new road off Kinnebec that um, may not be on the map. Um, I believe that's Laura who's offering that suggestion. Um, and so, Laura, I guess uh, what we would greatly appreciate is if that's the case to, to send us a, a note or a picture or a line of exactly where this is. Um, and I'm sure the project team can look into it as well. Is it possible, uh, Mike or Siobhan, for some of these maps, there may be smaller roads that, that aren't showing up on the concept. Um, do you want to uh, speak to that at all? Mike, well, there's a comment that there's a new road off Kennebec. Yeah, it's and it might be, um, it very well could be the Eastwood Homes property. I know there's, there's a road there being built for some homes being built there. And so I'm wondering if that's the one. And if that's the case, we are, we do know that's there. Um, we're, when we look at, just to let you know, when we look at this, we are looking at the most recent information from Wake County. And so, you know, if there's a new roadway or if there's new um, properties that have been subdivided or anything like that, we're including that in this and we're including that in our analysis. And so, 
Um, if we're not showing a road or if something's not showing up correctly, you know, obviously let us know, but we are using the, the most uh, recent information that we can get. Okay, great. Um, I'm checking in with the project team asking, asking if there are specific questions that we have not uh, covered. And um, in the meantime, uh, Kristen, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute you if you would. Uh, I see you have your hand raised. Um, go ahead and, and folks, again, this recording will be posted, so feel free to uh, uh, you know, hop off uh, at any point, and uh, you can uh, find the link and scroll to it later if you have other things you've got to get to. Bonnie, can I? Kristen? So Laura, Laura asked oh. a follow up. Can I answer her? Since oh, okay. she, since, we, since she specifically, she said she asked, does A two go through that? No, no. That the the point of A two is that we're staying. It would be either along the edge or to the to the left of that development, and you can see it's that. It's what's in brown on here. Thank you for bringing that back up, Siobhan. That Eastwood Homes is what's in brown right there. So I hope that answers that okay. question. Okay. And Laura, feel free to um, follow up uh, in the Q&A. Kristen, um, I think you're unmuted. Did you have a question for us? I do. Um, so I just, you know, going back to the MTP and, you know, noticing that the U.S. 401 bypass um, was proposed in 1999, but, you know, now with the growth of the area, there's new homes and new developments that weren't there before. Um, so I'm just curious what your plan is to accommodate for the current residential properties, as well as new and future properties, as, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, you're looking at 10 20 years down the line. So it sounds like there definitely will be new properties. Um, and this might be along the lines for the Fuquay Verena officials, but um, how is the town of Fuquay Verena able to issue building permits and clear zoning um, for new residential developments, knowing that this bypass is planned through to run through these properties? Um, once, uh, this is Tracy again, once, um, you know, we have a defined alignment, then it gets, um, into the town's CPP, then development that would come on the corridor would have to respect that. So that would cut down on the amount of conflict that you would have from new development. Um, that's one of the reasons that we do this planning is so that, you know, we don't, uh, uh, unnecessarily burden the public with the cost of having to buy all that infrastructure in the future um, that, you know, would potentially get built um, along the corridor. So there's a, um, you know, there's a little bit of work there that, you know, just from a planning standpoint that we would do once we have a, a, a defined alignment, uh, which is really impossible for us to do until we have something that's been fully vetted as, a, as an alignment. Bonnie, you're on mute. All right, fired from this role apparently. Um, Casey, uh, thanks first, Kristen and, Tr and Tracy, um, both of you for the question and the answer. Uh, and Kristen, I apologize, I did think we had answered that um, and had not. Casey, uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you uh, if you would, um, if you did have a question. It looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead. Yes, back to Laura's question regarding what I'm assuming is Kennebec Meadows. How will it directly affect Kennebec Meadows? I believe he mentioned that the neighborhood is on the left of A2. Is it? No, uh, the A2, A2 is on the left of the neighborhood. Okay. So then, so that, so the planned Kennebec, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to make sure you. No, you that's okay. Um, so Kennebec Meadows is what's in brown in the middle there where you see A2, A1, Hilltop Road. That's that's okay. the plan development. That that is that is Kennebec Meadows right there. Okay, so is A1 not going directly through that? It is. Yep. A1 so is the MTP alignment. And so, you know, that's this is the reason why we're doing this. We're looking at other alignments that don't affect 
properties as much as potentially as the original MTP alignment. So you can see there A2, A4, and A5 are on the outsides of the um, of that development. And then A3 is using Hilltop Road, which goes through the center. So really the, the other four alignments, A2, A3, A4, and A5 would have little to, right now as we see, would have little to no impacts to that development. Okay, and A1 would go directly through it. Correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Mike, um, do we, uh, and actually this may be another one uh, that Tracy could speak to just generally, but what percentage of costs for projects like this are, are typically provided by land developers? Do we, do we have any just general in the industry um, understanding or even in this area, how often land developers contribute to either the existing 401 improvements or the future US 401 um, uh, development? Um, this is Tracy again. It's, um, so you have two different authorities that go on here. The, the, the process that we're going through here on the 401 study is the more DOT process of how, you know, alignments get picked and that kind of thing. For the town, once we adopt the CTP, if a developer develops a piece of property that has a CTP requirement on it, they are required to, um, to in most cases, build a portion of it. In some cases, at least um, dedicate the right of way. So the developer is, you know, in it for the cost of the land that they have to provide. And um, depending upon the facility, um, you know, actual physical construction. Um, so if you look at the North Lakes, you know, subdivision, even then, or South Lakes and North Lakes, they built portions of Fuquay Verena Parkway because it was on our CTP. Um, and actually, in those cases, we were able to negotiate that because at that time, you know, we, the requirement was not that they build it. So they actually reserved all of that right of way and built a part of it. When you see the widenings on a lot of our normal thoroughfares like 55, that's usually a CTP requirement where the developer is required to invest in that widening, not the citizen. And so it's just our, you know, it's the tool that the legislature gave to towns to be able to, um, you know, you know, have the developer contribute to the network. Um, was there a second part to that? I think I, I think that covers the the CTP portion of that. Yeah, that's correct. Um, uh, Ms. Virginia was asking the, the cost. Um, and how often land developers help um, cover some of that. So that's good to know. Um, but there is a similar cost question, though. Um, but, uh, Kenneth, I'm going to throw this back to you just for the general construction of um, projects and how they tend to get phased. Uh, there is a question on the future 401 and how likely it is that the three segments, the way we've broken them up in this study, um, would be all constructed as one project, um, or would they likely be broken up like this and constructed at separate times? And again, this is just supposition at this point. Yes, and right now, basically, of course, it all a lot of, of defend, depends upon uh, funding and other factors concerning uh, in, in environmental constraints and other things of that particular nature. But uh, a lot of times, basically, it is is based on what is available in terms of funding, what could be done first and uh, determining which segments could be connected uh, first for uh, that funding. So that is the major thing that uh, uh, is important. And of course, uh, I, I could imagine, and this is just a uh, supposition from my part, that it would be broken up into uh, more than one phase. So depending upon uh, the funding that's available is what phase would be done uh, first, and then ultimately uh, they could be uh, finalized and completed over time. Okay. Um, and then there's a more uh, specific question. Will the public know by um, like the middle of next year, 2022, which um, alignments are chosen and also know about funding? I'm sure, Kenneth, the answer is no with regard to funding, but by the end of the study, um, what will we know about the route? Based on the study as has been outlined and the schedule has been outlined and presented by Mike and Siobhan, if you want to put up the 
uh, schedule that has been shown in the past that shows the uh, life cycle of this particular project. Uh, this is what we have again available. We're of course in stage two, phase three. Uh, we'll basically uh, define that deferred, deferred alternative for project adoption uh, by uh, uh, the spring of, the, of next year. So hopefully we'll have something by the end of June uh, or early uh, early next fiscal year, but more likely it'll be around the end of uh, or, or during the month of June. And that'll have recommended um, alignment. Uh, and then future studies and planning will still need to occur to do further work on, on, on the route. Um, and likely funding decisions are still likely to be um, made a little bit after that. Another question um, uh, Kristen was following on um, with regard to, you know, how we're doing outreach and engagement, I think, um, with regard to uh, future new roads, there's, um, and then our question really, I'm sorry, Kristen, I just read the actual end of your question, which is completely different. Um, it speaks a little bit more to um, uh, whether or not folks should know uh, and be informed that, that roadways are planned um, near, near properties when they own, uh, when they purchase them. That's not something I can specifically speak to. Does anybody know the answer to that? I'm not sure that we'd be giving you an official answer. Uh, and sorry, Mike and Kenneth, I don't know which one of you to ask for that. So I'll I'll let Kenneth answer first. If he can, if not, I can I can answer the question. Uh, Mike, if you could go ahead and answer. Yeah, that okay, question. that's yeah. fine. Yeah, when you when you um when you purchase a home and it's near any other type of major roadways or planned roadways, you're supposed to be informed. Um, as an example, I'm just gonna use my personal example. I bought a home uh, about four years ago, not far from a future section of 540. I actually had to sign an affidavit saying that I knew that the section of 540 was gonna be coming within a half a mile of my home. So um, it's supposed to be done when you purchase your home. So it's be disclosed. Um, what I would urge also to the general public is to do some due diligence um, and, you know, just, you know, look at maps and look at things, um, see if there's plans. Obviously, plans can change, but it's always good to look at those things. Um, but yes, it is. It is I, I don't want to say that it's by law that it has to be disclosed. I think it is, but I'm not 100 percent sure I'm not an attorney. Um, so I, I can't answer that question 100 percent truthfully. But Mike, I just believe is, that's this is case. Matt Poling. Um, Amen. Direct for town. Um, I just wanted to, to you know, kind of expand upon upon that question that, you know, all infrastructure, all roads have to be built in that subdivision before any any platting of any lots for homes to be built. So if there if there is a planned road on the CTP that is running through a proposed subdivision, that road has to be built before any lots or homes can be built. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt, for the clarification. Um, we have one more. Um, and and again, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not really sure what the, uh, who this should go to, um, Matt, or maybe this is back to you, but what happens when the builder is a local landowner and not an external developer? And Virginia, I'm not sure, does, I don't know that I understand that. Um, question, but do, maybe you guys do. So anytime there's a development that comes in and the property is sold, um, you know, they're, they're planning to develop it. They're planning to build roads, and infrastructure. Um, they're responsible for all those improvements and whether, whether they're roads or water or sewer. So there, there's really no difference whether they're a local or um, you know, whether they already own it or whether they, um, you know, are buying it. But once once they propose to change the land use, those, those uh, improvements are going to, going to be required of anybody who's trying to develop it. Thanks again. Um, uh, and Bonnie, just to follow up like on that. Sorry, it's Tracy. Um, you know, questions about stuff like that, you know, our planning staff, that's a good question for our planning staff because a lot of it is 
subdivision law. And so, you know, if you as a property owner decide to divide your property, really when some of those requirements get triggered as a part of that uh, process. And it, it's not respective of where you're from, but just the, the process that you engage in. So if you divide your land um, uh, into pieces, that's, uh, that's when that comes to bear. Okay. Um, and then we have a couple of uh, more specific questions that I would encourage you to um, reach out uh, to folks with regard in the land use community um, uh, with regard to what you're able to, to build on your property and whatnot. Um, the one final question that, that I don't think we've like 100% covered is um, this one from Melanie. And, and it's the question of, is the bypass 100% going to happen? And this is all just to decide which route. Um, Kenneth, I'm going to give that to you first, and if you would would prefer to to check and see if Chris is still out there, our um, the executive director, we can we can also have him speak to it. But if you would go ahead, uh, yes, I see Chris is still on the on the call. Uh, one of the things I'll just basically share uh, from this particular standpoint is it has been on our plans for uh, many years. Uh, as it stands right now, of course, the major thing that we need to define is, is this what, uh, is this still remain a part of the public will to uh, have this done? Uh, we recognize all facilities as a part of the public good, but the issue is, uh, is this still a part of the public will? And so uh, a lot of that will be defined uh, by the community as we are getting input. We thank you for the input and of course, by uh, the elected community of Fuqua uh, uh, Verena. So I'll leave it at that. And if our uh, uh, director has any other input that he wishes to give, uh, he can at this time. Thank you, sir. I was double muted there. Um, first, I just wanna say uh, thank you to everyone for participating this evening. Um, a very, um, a uh, well attended virtual event with a lot of very good comments, thoughtful comments and questions. Um, we appreciate all you all um, participating in that. Um, the answer to the question that was just asked is, is a little complicated. Um, the purpose of this study is was to review the line that was that, that is on the adopted plans. That line was drawn um, as, as Kenneth and Mike had, had mentioned several times throughout tonight. Um, you know, over time, um, but substantially several years ago, uh, several even decades ago, parts of it. And so this study is to look at that again and see if we have, um, you know, the best possible alignment we can have for this project. Um, the project is included in adopted plans. Uh, and so um, from that standpoint, um, it, it remains in the plan. As Kenneth mentioned, funding, uh, for major projects like this from um, state and federal sources um, primarily is a competitive process. And so as uh, we move forward in time, once we have this alignment um, uh, continued to, e to evolve, we would, we would look at that um, approximately every two years. Um, and those decisions are made sort of in 10 year chunks. So, Today, we would not say this thing, that this project is or is funded for construction. But um, over time, um, as the region continues to grow, we would continue to look at opportunities to fund this project. Great, thank you, Chris, and thanks, Kenneth. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up with everybody and uh, as we close out the meeting here, I think we've gotten um, to all of the questions um, and if you do still have questions, um, please send an email to us. Uh, it's actually very similar to the website address. It's um, US 401 corridor study at publicinput.com. You can, excuse me, also leave a voicemail. Um, that number is 1-855-925-2801.
That was 855-925-2801. And you need to use the project code of 8961. That code is 8961 um, for anyone who wants to leave a voicemail for the 401 corridor study. And then you can, again, I definitely encourage everyone to sign up for updates. And then the number one thing is encouraging folks to um, uh, uh, participate in the survey at just us401corridorstudy.com. You can click into the survey directly from there. Um, we so appreciate the amount of time that folks have stayed on for this meeting tonight. Uh, the strong majority of you continued to make it all the way to the end, two and a half hours almost. Um, and thank you, thank you to our consulting team, to our partners in Fuquay Verena, Matt and Tracy, um, and to uh, all of the WSP team. You guys really worked hard on this. And, and um, the presentation was a lot of dense information. Um, we did our best to try to make it uh, digestible. Um, and would welcome your feedback about the meeting as well. Feel free to send us an email um, to that effect. We always, always are looking to improve our processes. With that, I think it's time for some of us to go eat dinner, some of us to go to bed, some of us to go take a, uh, an ibuprofen. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has a good night. Again, thank you very much for taking the time to participate, and stay tuned, please. Help us spread the word us401corridorstudy.com, and it looks like I'm going to move into a career as a radio announcer. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>